And in the last lecture for today, we will continue with upper gastrointestinal, but we'll be focusing predominantly on the stomach. And that is worksheet 9.3. The following were all student submissions around the middle of spring semester last year, and I just thought they were very telling about how students were feeling at the time. So I'll just put these up here. You can pause if you want to read, otherwise we'll move on. They're pretty funny. We'll begin today by just reviewing the basic function and anatomy of the stomach. Did you know that your stomach actually moves and churns digested material that you swallowed? So as you kind of chew it up and swallow it down the esophagus, it enters into the stomach and then gets bathed in acid, but the stomach starts moving it around like a cement mixer, and then will slowly start releasing it through the pyloric sphincter into the small intestine in order to be absorbed. As we just learned in that brief TikTok, both chemical and mechanical digestion occur within the stomach. I think most people probably don't think about the mechanical digestion that also occurs. Um, and remember, when we take that bowl of food that enters from the esophagus and it enters into the stomach and mixes with digestive juices, it becomes chyme, that acidic mixture. We see that both digestion of protein and fat begin within the stomach. And we also see that three to four liters of food and drink and saliva enter the stomach daily. So picture that, that is a ton. And on average, that ingested material remains there for anywhere from two to six hours. So the stomach really serves as a holding bag, we say. And so it holds that partially digested material and then it controls the release into the duodenum of the small intestine where the majority of digestion actually occurs. Not a lot of absorption occurs in the stomach, not much at all. In fact, it's limited to small nonpolar things like alcohol and aspirin. The stomach has three main regions that have been divided based on function. At the top of the stomach, so we have this characteristic J shape, we see the fundus. And the fundus is superior to or above this esophageal opening. Okay. The fundus also has the weakest muscular contractions of the stomach, and it actually has a little higher pH than the other sections as well. Within the fundus, we will find the pacemaker cells that initiate that slow wave potential that will move down the rest of the stomach to aid in mechanical digestion. Next, we have the middle section of the stomach, the body. This area predominantly serves as storage for the stomach. Some digestion occurs here as well. And that's followed by the antrum. Now, the, both the body and the fundus have weak musculature compared to the antrum. Okay. So more robust musculature. And this is where we get the majority of the mixing of the contents with the gastric juices. One of the main roles of the stomach, as we mentioned, is storage. It serves as that holding bag. It takes, while it may take you just mere minutes to actually consume a meal, it takes the body a lot longer in order to properly digest and absorb that meal. So the stomach can kind of meter out in small doses contents into the small intestine. So not all of it is flooded there at once. We need to give the small intestine time to properly digest and absorb that material. Related to the storage ability of the stomach, we can see all these gastric folds here, or rugae, within the stomach. They allow the stomach to distend with food and stretch. And we only see the rugae when the stomach um, is empty. When it's stretched with ingested material and chyme, then those rugae disappear. Now, the other role of the stomach, of course, is digestion. And we see that carbohydrate digestion continues in the body. So while it started in the oral cavity, it continues within the body of the stomach, and then protein digestion begins in the antrum. Now let's take a look at the stomach wall. Since the stomach is part of the GI tract, it's gonna have those four characteristic layers or tunics that we talked about 
in the first lecture for today. So we'll start with the mucosa, and then we have our simple columnar epithelium. And actually, there's pretty high turnover of that columnar epithelium here due to the acids of the stomach. That's followed by the lamina propria and then the muscular layer of the mucosa. The next layer is the submucosa. Here we see our submucosal neck, uh, nerve plexus, and then we're followed by the muscularis. Now we had two layers within the muscularis when we talked generally about the layers of the GI tract, the circular layer and the longitudinal layer. Here, within the stomach wall, we have an additional layer of muscle called the oblique layer. Now, the oblique layer kind of adds another dimension to contractions and assists churning and blending that occurs within the stomach. And this muscularis layer is going to progressively thicken as we move from the body of the stomach to that pyloric sphincter before entering into the duodenum. And then finally, we have our serosa layer. Um, the last thing I'm going to point out here before we move on are these gastric pits that are characteristic to the stomach wall. Now we'll turn to the gastric pits and glands and look at the secretory cells that are found within them. And the second type of cell in the gastric pit is the mucous neck cells. Won't say too much about these other than that they secrete an acidic mucin. So that's in contrast to the surface mucus cells that secrete that alkaline mucus. Uh, the mucous neck cells, hey, they help maintain that acidic environment uh, created by hydrochloric acid. And both these cells within the gastric pits, their job is to help with lubrication. The mucus there that's produced, it protects the stomach lining from abrasion. Moving into the gastric glands then, uh, we'll begin with the parietal cells. And importantly, these secrete hydrochloric acid, which is responsible for that low pH environment we see within the stomach, around 1.5 to 2.5 for pH. And that hydrochloric acid helps break down uh, the cell walls of plants we've eaten or breaking down connective tissue, animal tissue. It helps denature proteins. And then finally, that hydrochloric acid converts pepsinogen to pepsin. And pepsin is what can further break down protein. Into uh, 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 uh. The next cells within the gastric glands are the chief cells. Uh, they're the most numerous. Uh, that's why they were named the chief cells. And chief cells secrete pepsinogen. We just mentioned that's that precursor to pepsin, which ultimately helps digest denatured proteins. And it's an interesting mechanism. Um, so these chief cells, they're going to secrete these little granules that contain pepsinogen. And then they'll be converted into pepsin within that low pH environment. And the reason that Pepsin isn't made within the chief cells is because pepsin would actively dissolve the proteins of the chief cells. So it's made in this two-step process. And the last cells in the gastric glands are the G cells. G cells are hormone-producing cells, and they secrete the hormone gastrin, hence G. They secrete gastrin into the blood, 
which stimulates stomach motility and secretions. Here we have a very helpful summary table reviewing the secretory cells of the gastric pits and glands that we just reviewed. First we have these mucus cells and specifically we're talking about the surface mucus cells, those that secrete that alkaline mucus, not the mucus neck cells. And we said that those mucus cells were stimulated by mechanical stimulation within the stomach. And we said also that its role is to have that alkaline mucus protect the stomach against acid injury. Next, we have those chief cells, named so because they're so numerous, and they secrete those granules that contain pepsinogen. Okay. The stimulation for this is parasympathetic activation, so the release of acetylcholine, remember, rest and digest. And then we also see it stimulated by gastrin. And we said that gastrin secreted by those G cells stimulates secretions. And pepsinogen secreted by the chief cells after activation by hydrochloric acid is going to be able to start the digestion of protein. And that's a nice transition to parietal cells, which secrete hydrochloric acid. And again, that's under stimulation of parasympathetic activation or gastrin that stimulates secretions. And that converts that pepsinogen to pepsin. And hydrochloric acid also breaks down connective tissue, denatures proteins. And finally, we have our G cells. Those are those hormone-producing cells within the gastric glands. And they're going to secrete gastrin. And gastrin secretion is going to be stimulated by different proteins within the lumen or parasympathetic activation. And as we just saw, gastrin can stimulate those parietal and chief cells to secrete pepsinogen and hydrochloric acid. Now you'll notice these are labeled as endocrine and exocrine. So remember that exocrine, we're going to get secretions that are occur outside of the body. And you have to remember that the lumen of the GI tract is technically outside of the body because it's going from open opening in the oral cavity to opening at the anus. Okay? We can compare that then to the endocrine, which are secreted inside the body. That gastrin is going to be released and travel to the blood. We will now look at how the parietal cells help form hydrochloric acid and then the actions of hydrochloric acid. We'll look at a single parietal cell here. And remember that the parietal cells are responsible for that low pH environment in the stomach around 1.5 to 2.5 because they secrete hydrochloric acid. Now the first step in creating hydrochloric acid within the parietal cell is going to be splitting water. The water inside the parietal cell becomes dissociated into a hydrogen ion and a hydroxide ion. So we see water split into H plus and OH minus. Now that water has dissociated into its individual ions, the next step is we will use a pump. So we're going to pump that hydrogen ion into the lumen of the gastric gland using a hydrogen potassium pump. This is an ATPase pump, so it's active transport. It's going to move hydrogen ion outward and then potassium into the cell against its gradient. To zoom out a little bit, because it's a little hard to see before, we have moved hydrogen now into the lumen, or the open space, of this gastric gland. The hydrogen ion has been moved into the lumen of the gastric gland, but we still have our hydroxide ion. That hydroxide ion binds with CO2 that's found within the cell to form bicarbonate. Bicarbonate is then going to be moved out of the parietal cell and into the blood. And this occurs via an exchanger specific to the gastric parietal cells. And this is specifically an antiport transporter. So we'll move bicarbonate down its concentration gradient into the blood. And simultaneously, we'll be moving chloride against its electrochemical gradient into the parietal cell. So our 
chloride will concentrate within the parietal cell and then can move down its concentration gradient into the lumen of the gastric gland. So we have our hydrogen ion we pumped out and now we have our chloride ion that has moved down its gradient and those two will combine within the lumen of the gastric gland to form hydrochloric acid. The hydrochloric acid can then leave via the gastric pit and enter the stomach. The lumen of the stomach. Now that we've made hydrochloric acid, we can look at some of its actions in a little more detail. So recall that our chief cells within the gastric glands are going to be secreting pepsinogen. That's that inactive precursor of pepsin. Uh, pepsin. And then we just said our parietal cells uh, allow us to make that hydrochloric acid that's going to be released in the stomach. And that's going to combine with pepsinogen. So HCl secreted by the parietal cells is going to activate the enzyme precursor, pepsinogen, to form pepsin. And pepsin can now work to begin to denature and digest protein. So pepsin initiates protein digestion by splitting certain amino acid linkages in those proteins that's going to give us smaller peptide fragments, just small chains of amino acids. And the other actions of hydrochloric acid we mentioned before are that it can break down connective tissue and muscle fibers. So therefore we're taking these large food particles and we're helping break them into smaller particles. And then HCl helps denature protein. So that is, it uncoils the protein from their folded final form and it exposes more of those peptide bonds for attack by enzymes like pepsin so that we can break them into smaller fragments. And then finally, it is very good at killing a lot of the bacteria, though some do go on to proliferate. Now we'll look at the role of the mucus layer within the stomach. What then prevents hydrochloric acid from damaging the cells of the stomach walls? Well, let's take a look here. First, the cells themselves, the cells of the lumen, are impermeable to hydrochloric acid, so they can't go through the cell. And if we look at our key here, they're showing that this little symbol is saying that passage is prevented. So we see that symbol here, so it can't go through the cell. But then notice, these cells are also connected via tight junctions. Remember, those are those KISS proteins that join adjacent cells. They're tight, so nothing can fit through, including a hydrochloric acid. Okay. Now, in addition to that, we have a, a mucus coating. This is actually pretty thick. It's about two millimeters thick, and that prevents injury to that innermost mucosal layer of the stomach, both mechanical and chemical damage that could occur without that mucus coating. Now, within that mucus layer, we have a high concentration of bicarbonate. And that bicarbonate molecule, which is secreted by mucus cells, helps keep the pH around 7. So when hydrochloric acid encounters that bicarbonate within that mucus layer, a little reaction occurs, and we're just left with water, H2O, and then CO2 as byproducts. Now, the other thing that mucus coating does is it helps prevent the cells from the other digestive enzymes like pepsin, which would degrade the proteins in the cells. So as a think-pair-share here, what would occur if the mucus layer is not creating a proper barrier? Barrier. You might have some idea. Well, if you said stomach ulcers, you would be correct. And we get ulcers when they're, for some reason, some type of erosion of that mucosal layer. With that mucus layer gone, the acids and the pepsin, they can damage the submucosal layers. And those tend to be highly vascular, as we learn, and that can lead to substantial bleeding. So how does this occur? Well, one of the culprits is Heliobacter pylori, and that weakens that protective mucus coating. And when that occurs then, the pepsin and the acid eat through, and if that gets all the way through all the layers, we call that a perforation. That's complete erosion through the stomach wall, and your digestive contents that, are in, contents that are in that lumen can leak into the intraperitoneal space. That's the 
within the peritoneal cavity, the area that contains the abdominal organs. And then if that happens, you are at risk for sepsis, and it is very serious. Now we'll look at gastric motility and cues from the small intestine. The stomach, like other sections of the GI we've talked about, exhibits basal electrical rhythm. That's B E R. And that's a product of these pacemaker cells in the fundus. Uh, that's that area of the stomach above this esophageal sphincter. And we also call these pacemaker cells those interstitial cells of Cajal we've spoken about before. So that is C-A-J-A-L. So they initiate this basal electrical rhythm, those rhythmic depolarizations. And then depending on the level of excitability within the smooth muscle, maybe we got some parasympathetic activity. We will hit threshold. And if we hit threshold, we get these peristaltic waves that kick off from the fundus and work their way down toward the pyloric sphincter. In the contraction, it just builds and becomes more vigorous as it moves toward the antrum, that lower portion of the stomach. Now, with this wave of contraction, the peristalsis, it's going to propel the chyme here, the contents, the bolus mixed with the acidic solution within the stomach, it's going to propel that towards the pyloric sphincter. And a tiny bit is pushed through the pyloric sphincter before we get complete tight closure of that sphincter. So when that peristaltic contraction ultimately reaches that pyloric sphincter, the sphincter is tightly closed and no more emptying take place after that little bit is pushed through. So when the chyme that's been propelled forward hits that closed sphincter, the rest of it, the majority of that chyme, it's propelled backwards, back into the antrum. And then it occurs again with the next peristaltic contraction. And we call this retropulsion. Retro meaning backwards. So we're throwing that chyme backwards over and over again to mix it. And it's these antroperistaltic contractions that drive the emptying of the stomach. With each contraction, we said that there's a little bit of chyme that's pushed through. So if we continue to increase the strength of those antral contractions, those peristaltic contractions, will ultimately push more and more chyme through. And the strength of those contractions is going to depend on signals from the duodenum. So the duodenum here, if we look, is the first section of small intestine that is attached to the stomach. Okay, and then follows the jejunum and the ileum. So it's this very short section of small intestine. And the stomach is going to receive cues from the duodenum. And the duodenum is going to help slow the emptying of the stomach in the presence of fat, acid, and distension. So let's walk through these different cues and see how that works. Think of the duodenum as sampling those gastric contents. So the stomach's going to give the duodenum a, a little bit of chyme. And then the duodenum's going to sample it and we'll say halt or proceed. It'll say stop, I'm not ready, I'm still digesting what's here. Or give me some more, I've digested and absorbed and I can handle some more. So fat is one of these cues. Now fat takes more time to both digest and absorb. And we see that digestion and absorption of fat only takes place within the duodenum. If we detect fat in the duodenum, then it prevents further gastric emptying. The fat there is saying, I need more time to digest and absorb. And this fat has the greatest ability of all the nutrients to stop gastric emptying. Another cue is the presence of acid. So we just learned that the stomach secretes hydrochloric acid. And then that is going to be neutralized in that upper section of the small intestine, the duodenum, by sodium bicarbonate that is produced by the liver. If it goes unneutralized, that acid is going to irritate the mucosal layer. So unneutralized acid sends a signal to the stomach to stop gastric emptying until we can neutralize that existing acid. 
And the third cue would just be physical distension of the duodenum. Excess chyme is going to prevent the stomach from emptying additional contents. It bides time to cope with the excess volume of chyme and allows us to process that before we get more from the stomach. The basal electrical rhythm of the stomach and the resulting contractions can be altered by both nervous reflexes and hormone. So that's what we're going to look at next. There are three phases that we're going to review related to stomach regulation. First up, we have the cephalic phase, cephalic meaning head. Uh, this is helpful to remember because the cephalic reflex is triggered by the thought, smell, sight, or taste of food, things that we do with our head. So nerve signals from the higher regions of the brain, they're going to be sent to the hypothalamus, and then they're going to be relayed to the medulla oblongata. The medulla within the brain stem, that's going to increase parasympathetic stimulation to the stomach via the vagus nerve. And via that vagus nerve from the medulla, we're going to cause both an increase in the contractile force in the stomach, so we increase motility, and then the secretory activity of the gastric glands. Next, the gastric phase. And this is also aptly named. Um, it's initiated after the bolus of material enters the stomach, hence gastric. And this phase has both nervous and hormonal components. We'll begin with the nervous component, the gastric reflex. So as food enters the stomach, baroreceptors detect stretch and chemoreceptors are going to detect the presence of proteins. Nerve signals are sent to the medulla, which leads to the same outcome as the cephalic reflex. So we saw an increase in stomach motility and secretory activity from the gastric cells. Now for the hormonal component, the presence of food, specifically protein in the stomach, is going to cause gastrin release from the G cells. And we previously saw that gastrin release leads to all stomach cell secretions. So we see HCL, pepsinogen, mucus, and gastrin also increases motility. All right, and finally we have the intestinal phase. And you guessed it, it involves processes when chyme reaches the small intestine. Uh, this phase is also regulated by both nervous system and endocrine system, like the gastric phase was. So we'll start with the intestinal reflex, that's that nervous component, and it's initiated when acidic chyme enters the duodenum and is detected by chemoreceptors there. Now, this causes a decrease in nerve signals being sent to the medulla. In turn, the medulla decreases nerve signals sent to the stomach to decrease force of contraction and release of the secretions. We can see that this intestinal reflex directly opposes both the cephalic and gastric reflexes, which do the opposite. They're going to increase secretion and force of contraction in the stomach. Now, for the hormonal components of the intestinal phase, we have cholecystokinin, CCK, and secretin. So CCK, when the duodenum detects fatty chyme, it's going to decrease motility within the stomach. Secretin, in response to acidic chyme within the duodenum, is going to decrease secretory activity within the stomach. Detection of either fatty chyme or acidic chyme within the duodenum uh, signals that the duodenum needs more time to process, digest, and absorb that food, and that's why it's going to slow gastric emptying. And the final thing I'll mention related to both cholecystokinin and secretin is that they're they are also going to inhibit gastrin release so that we won't get the release of those other secretory products from those other gastric cells.